So talking about HTML5 storage today, uh, just real quick, I'm Ray Camden. I'm an evangelist for Adobe uh, with a focus on web standards, mobile, cold fusion, uh, web technology in general, or whatever basically excite, excites me during the day is what I'm doing. Uh, I blog at RaymondCamden.com, and if you want to get this presentation and all the code, that's actually the next slide. Uh, but also, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at CF Jedi Master, and I only talk about very serious, important, work-related, safe stuff. So <laughs> definitely follow me; you won't regret it. Um, there is lots of code I'm showing today. I'll probably skip over some of them because I have a lot. Uh, I tend to go into demo over mode, uh, overload when I when I do presentations. So if you don't see something for too long. You can download everything actually right now at GitHub and actually play along with me while I talk about this stuff. Um, one thing I will point out, I am going to be using jQuery. Uh, I tend to try or I'm trying not to rely on jQuery. jQuery is a wonderful tool, uh, but like all really nice tools, it gets a bit overused. Uh, a lot of, of what people use jQuery for, you don't really need anymore. Uh, so, for example, selecting a DOM by ID is actually built into most browsers now. You don't need jQuery just to do that. Uh, but all things being considered, jQuery does make things easier. So I will use jQuery to skip over some of those simpler steps and, and get things done quicker. But every single feature I'm talking about today is very agnostic on your framework. So if you are a whatever that is besides jQuery, if you're an EXT guy, uh, you can definitely do everything I'm showing today with EXT or even, Lord forbid, Adobe Spry. Anyone here still using Spry? So if you are, please stop using it. <laughs> stop. I'm telling you right now. And I love Spry. Just stop using it right now. Uh, but again, so yeah, do not do not assume that the jQuery stuff is required. So why would we be concerned about storing anything? True story. So uh, actually going back to Adobe Spry, uh, I had avoided the front end for like 10 years because it was really gnarly, it was really ugly. Uh, I was doing just cool fusion work, so I just cared about the back end. Adobe Spry actually got me thinking more about doing Ajax. This was like five years or so ago. And I got really kind of excited about it. I got into jQuery and all that. And so I, I had this very traditional web 1.0 web application. It was a bug tracker. And you had projects and you had bugs. And it was really just forms and tables. Simple, right? So I got real excited about Ajax, and I said, okay, I'm gonna make this an Ajax Web 2.0, snazzy, awesome, kick-ass web app. And I did that, and it worked really, really well. And then something really crazy happened. Um, I deployed this to my own personal website, and I used it for my side projects and stuff like that, and had this one client, and things didn't go well. Have we had that project where things didn't go well? So he was up to bug like 900 or something in his project. And I had this code that was using Ajax, right? So it was fast. And I was calling the server to say, give me an XML representation of all the bugs so I could do nice client-side rendering and all that. And it was doing you know, 900 rows of XML. And it was really, really slow. And that was like a quick wake-up call that just converting something to Ajax doesn't automatically make it faster. So not only was I having an issue with just too much data being sent over the wire every single time you viewed that project, if you like would, would view his project and then go into a bug report and then go back, I was getting all 900 rows of XML all over again. Not only was I having that issue, HTTP in, in general can be a bit fat. Obviously not so fat that the web hasn't kind of taken off, but if you're doing a heck of a lot of Ajax type calls, each of those calls is doing a whole suite of things to like open the connection to the server and do that communication. Okay, It tends to add up. Also, sometimes our data is not changing. If, for example, you have an intranet application for your company and part of the data was your offices, typically you're not getting a new physical location every day or even every month or every year. If you have 32 offices across the globe with contact numbers, addresses, uh, etc. why not send that to the user one time and worry about updating it when you buy new real estate? And of course, obviously, sometimes we're not online. 
Uh, as much as I love my phones and love all my cool devices and I love that I have 3G, 4G, whatever, it's still not very uh, persistent. It's still not something that I can rely on all the time. I, I don't even know if I can call 911 half the time. Uh, I, I'm in a, you know, a major city. So we have web apps now that, if built correctly, could actually work fine with those bad connections being in there. So what my plan is, is I'm going to talk about a variety of different technologies, okay? Kind of starting off with the old school and getting into the more fancy ones. And then I'm going to show you the demos. I'm going to show you some code about, you know, how you actually work with these things. And then after I've got you really excited about how cool this stuff is, then I'll show you actually where this stuff works so you can go home and cry about how IE is not supporting a particular feature. Now, that's part of my evil plan A. Plan B, and, and I will warn you, if you guys have never seen me present, I do multiple little sermons, so this is just one of them. We've got to stop thinking about web technology as like binary. It's like for a long time we've said, you know, if IE6 can't do it, I just I won't do it, right? Or if IE8 won't support some feature, I won't bother coding. And that's a big mistake. There are some really, really powerful features out there that are A, powerful, and B, easy to use where if only 10% of your audience could use, I could see actually going to management saying, let's add this to our website. Uh, a great example of that is geolocation, okay? Most commercial websites like Starbucks, right, will have a store locator, and we all know how that works. We go in, we type in our zip code, and it says, oh look, here's the stores. I could use geolocation just to totally skip that step and just say, bam, here's a close to Starbucks. That code is literally five minutes. Now, granted, I know the geolocation API, but I could teach you guys that in like 10 minutes. So if only half my people support geolocation, half those people are getting an incredible experience. They're saying, wow, the site knows where I am. It's telling me to close the store. That's great. So it's a minimal investment. Even though only a minority of my users supported, I'm making the experience so much better for them that hopefully, there is kind of like a side effect, you know, they tell their friends, yeah, I do Starbucks because, heck, I go on my website, I go on, on their app and they tell me the closest Starbucks there is. I go straight for my uh, caffeine uh, fix. So stuff like that, I think, is worthwhile to add even if not your entire audience is using a particular feature. And that was the first sermon, not too bad, right? Okay, there, there is more coming, I promise. So. The order of, of technologies, uh, it's kind of uh, uh, sorted by easiest, oldest, to really, really hardest and not very well supported. Uh, so this is when you guys want to hand me a beer, because that's when it gets really bad. Actually, it gets kind of bad here, too. So a beer here, two beers there. Um, I want to start off talking about cookies. Even though this is the oldest technology, it is actually storing something on the client. It, it does count. Uh, it's not sexy. Uh, it was really abused. It was really uh, scary for a long time. I remember, do you guys remember, uh, I've, I've been in web since like 95, and I remember it seemed like we spent years worrying about cookies. Like, oh my god, cookies were going to kill us like zombies and take over the planet. Uh, it's still a big deal in Europe, uh, surprisingly. Ignoring all that, <laughs> It is actually probably the most supported way of just saying, I want the client to remember a piece of data. Now you have a lot of limits on what you can say, and we'll talk, to some, uh, we'll talk about some specifics in a second. And it's also not very performant in, in, in terms of, it will actually transfer back and forth between the client and the server for every request. So all the benefit of like me sending you data once is gone. Okay, but if you want rock solid, probably very well darn, darn well supported storage, this is your still your best option. And you are limited to simple values, but you can encode them, and you'll see that in a variety of uh, technologies. In terms of possible uses, and I have this slide for all these technologies, and this is just a few things I can think of. Obviously, there's more examples than this, but one of the big uses is just to mark someone in a particular way so, so that we can consider them authenticated on the server. And also, we can also uh, consider preferences. For example, uh, if, you, if your site has themes, light, dark, whatever, you can use a cookie to record what they want and 
pick that up on the server as well. So, how many cookies? According to the spec, which is super old, they actually had computers in 97, uh, your browser can have at least 300 cookies, 4K each, which is not that big, it's actually kind of small if you think about it, and 20 per your neat post. And uh, it's funny, the spec actually says at least 20. It does, it says at least 20. For a long time, browsers said, oh, you mean at most 20, right? Obviously at most. I spent two days fighting a bug where user would log into like a subsite and then they'd be logged off immediately. And it was the fact that this was a huge CMS site. It was all due to the fact that we were sending 21 cookies. And the browser never said a word, just silently ignored that extra cookie. Then, of course, there was no fire bug back then, there was nothing back then. but. Yeah, so two days lost of me just trying to figure out why that wasn't happening. Nowadays, uh, I tested in Chrome and I got up to 145 cookies before Apache actually started to block me. So the 20 thing is kind of out of here. But there's absolutely no really good way to handle even knowing that outside of on your server setting a cookie and on the next request seeing if, it's, seeing if it gets sent back. But there's no way in JavaScript, for example, to say, hey, you know, on cookie rejection, do whatever. So as a very simple example, uh, you have a document.cookie object in the browser, and you can set a key equals value pair like so. If you want to specify some arguments, and there's some arguments in terms of timeout, subdomains, et cetera, blah, 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 you can, you can specify them with a semicolon after the key value pair. Really, NFL? How lame. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so let's actually look at a quick example. Okay. And again, the jQuery stuff just to make life easier. So all I'm doing here is on document load, I'm doing a few quick tests, okay? First, I can actually look at document.cookie to see everything in there. This is one big ginormous string, so if I want to actually know what's going on, I have to do a bit of parsing on it. So I added a button that allows me to add a new cookie. On that click, I split the string. Every cookie is delimited, de delimited by a semicolon. So this will give me how many I have. And I create a new one by saying new cookie size plus one equals foo, okay? And then I could look, uh, I, I record uh, how many are there. So kind of a stupid example, but and go into console and Voila, and so this, this is that entire string, and embedded in here will be my semicolons somewhere in there. But essentially, it's a big string, so if you're looking to do some complex things like here are your cookies, here are other values, you will be using JavaScript, JavaScript string functions to parse that. Setting, though, at least is easier. I didn't have to like append to a string. By just writing directly to document.cookie with a new value, it will append that to the end, which makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. Uh, again, this is old school, pre-standards. It just kind of works. And I just keep clicking, and if I reload, I can see that's obviously longer. You guys can hopefully believe me that that cookie is there now. And actually, if I click new, you can see it's it's getting bigger. And again, I got Chrome to about 144 before Apache started being upset. So, simple example. Uh, one thing I will point out. Uh, in general, you can use it uh, everywhere. People do still turn off cookies, believe it or not. Uh, but in general, in terms of, of, of the actual browser supporting it, it Every single thing on the planet supports the uh, cookies. Now, it's really, really old. Uh, one thing I will point out, if you need to look to see what cookies are available, at least in Chrome, 
you can go into resources and cookies and see them all there. So very, very handy for debugging just to see the values that, that are in there. And if you want to, you can actually get rid of them pretty easily. So if you can't do multiple, I think. Let's try that again, see what happens. That's a very bad UI bug there. Just a handy little tool to see what's going on. Any questions on that? I know that was the boring one. All right, so let's get out of the last century and talk about something a bit nicer. Uh, local storage, also known as DOM storage, but pretty much everyone calls it local storage. I think Justice Speck calls it uh, DOM storage. This is an API to set key value pairs of data. So I may set something called name, the value Raymond. I may set something called age equals 39. There is both an API and the ability to directly set a bit like cookie stuff, but nicer. It's also limited to simple values, but you can use JSON to encode something more complex. So for example, I could JSON stringify an array, that would give me a string, save that into local storage. And when I need it again, do JSON parse on it to get the native array back. There is also a session-based version has the exact same API. Everything works the exact same. Just it will die when this session ends. And in terms of this session, it's as long as the tab is open. It's not a time-based system. If you wanted to add a time-based session, you could use local storage. Again, let's say, for example, I last hit the page at this uh, date timestamp. When you go there again, do a quick comparison. If it's been too long, clear out the session values. Does that kind of make sense? This is 100% uh, client side only. It is not sent back and forth to the server, so immediately it's gonna be a lot nicer than cookies. Uh, as for some examples, uh, more preferences that your server may not need to know if you have uh, dynamic CSS that is picking up on local storage, it could pick the particular theme to use. Um, search history, I have an example of that. You know, essentially, kind of small things that you want to store about the user. Things that you don't need to know on the server. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, in terms of storage, basically two and a half megs which should be plenty for anybody, right? Uh, there is some variety, and if you're really curious about it, you can go to this little page here, which will show you all of them. And this is not the one I was thinking about. Uh, oh, there we go. You see, it's, it's for the most part, it's 2.49 with some, like, Blackberry, I'm sorry, no, it, Camino giving you five megs for whatever reason. I think in general it's safe to assume 2.5 megs. So as a quick example, I mentioned, and that's kind of hard to read, isn't it? How's that? Okay, that's awesome. Uh, so there is an API that has a few methods. For example, you can see set item and get item remove item, I don't probably have to tell you what those guys do. At the same time, you can also treat local storage, the object, like a structure or like a basic hash map, where I can directly set values in there. I actually prefer the non-API way, it's just less typing. Uh, outside of uh, delete feels a bit awkward compared to remove item, so I use the API for that. And obviously clear is a bit shorter than going through all of them and killing each one by itself. But for the most part, I really prefer just doing it like so. So as an example, I have a couple here. So all I've done here, when the page loads, I want to build a simple functionality where I know how many times you've hit my website. So maybe after like 100 hits, I say, hey, you're a great user, here's a coupon for a free uh, code school class or whatever, okay? Uh, and by the way, don't do that because you can edit 
those local storage values and set it to whatever you want. Uh, so uh, don't do what I just said. Um, keep that in mind. Uh, so all I'm doing here, uh, I'm not using the API. So I'm basically grabbing the value. If it's null, empty, whatever, I default it to zero. Now these do come on as strings, so I'll do a parse it just to make sure it's a proper number for JavaScript, and then just add one to it, store it, and write it out. So kind of brain dead, simple storage. And if we look at this, you'll see that I've been here two times. And if I reload, it just works. And if I close this or if I just reload it, I'll do x equals one to do a reload. It is remembering that value. And honestly, I mean, this API is about as easy as it can be. Just plain running to a value. This is the exact same code, but this is the session based one. The only thing I changed was local the session. That's it. So if I go in here now, this darn well better say one. Yep. And if I were to close Chrome completely and come back, it would go back to one. But I mean, using it, writing to it, the exact same. Because the first one is infinite? Yeah, I wouldn't say infinite. <laughs> I would say very long lasting. Uh, I have not tested local storage after a browser update. Uh, I've not noticed Chrome erasing stuff, even though Chrome does update like once a week or so. Um, but I can't tell you for sure it lasts through a restart, uh, through a upgrade of the browser. If I, had to, if I had to guess, I would say probably Chrome keeps it because, it because it does update often, and maybe IE would not because that's like once a decade or so. We can test it right now. Can you? Cool, let us know. So a bit more of an advanced example. I mean, that, that's a bit more practical. I have a simple form here. Let me hide this real quick. And I can type into it. And if I click store, I'm actually using local storage now to save these form values. So if I come back here, I will leave, test three, come back. I can restore that on load. So a really good example of this is what if the browser closes, uh, crashes before the, the user submits, it, it doesn't persist? No. In Chrome? I was using Chrome Canary and it had an update. And, and it wiped it. It wiped it. So definitely not infinite. <laughs> um, the code for this actually is really, really trivial. So this is the persistence right here basically have a click handler for the button and I grab each of those three values. I create a quick temporary object and I use native JSON parsing, or I should say uh, feature to turn that into a string and store it into local storage. This is run when the document loads. So this handles setting the value if it exists. So what you can imagine, you know, I, I put a little store button in there just to make it a bit obvious. I click here to store. Uh, you can also have an interval where every 10 seconds the value gets stored. Uh, I have done that on my blog, for example, where I'll be writing a blog entry and I may screw something up or I may close the browser. I have done that a lot of times where I accidentally kill my browser. Not, not crashing, I, just, I, I close the browser or I'll close the tab. I'll have a timed interval where every 10 seconds it just stores that string. And that way I, I never lose a blog entry because it's being stored in local session. But you said it wasn't secure, really? You could edit it? Because we deal with banks, so that'd be a nice feature to store their data, but it's not secure. So a great example of this is uh, Mozilla built a very fancy HTML5 RPG game where you would, it was multiplayer web sockets and you would run around and you would kill monsters and get treasure and all that. And it was multiplayer, so real people were playing next to you and you could see them doing stuff. The player data was all stored in local storage. So I started looking into it and I found my inventory data and I found where it was pointing to and I gave myself the best armor. 
just because it was this numeric values. So I, I, I hacked the game. That's not really a hack per se, but multiplayer, I mean, if they were keeping track of a leaderboard, that'd be a quick way to kind of jump to the top. Uh, so in their uh, scenario, I'd maybe say, do local storage plus a sync to the server where you compare like last time they played to what is being loaded in local storage and see if it uh, matches. For a bank, you could do nothing at all, no. Uh, maybe like the last tab they picked, stuff like that. Uh, uh, search history, I don't, you don't really search at a bank. I mean, there, there, there are still things that you could safely store that if someone were to look at or change, it wouldn't hurt anything. Local storage is that per page or is that like per domain? It's yeah, per domain, much like cookies. And I will point out so this is file based. So this is actually writing to the file. So if you set like a billion small like local storage bracket key x equals one, when you hit that page again, the browser finds the file based data, reads it all in, and puts it into the local storage object. So don't do that. We all got the yeah, so it's simple, right? I, I, I say this because there were some blog posts out there warning people against local storage because it would, you know, file I.O., as we all know, is a bit slow. I think any, any normal usage of this, especially for key value pairs, which would be, again, preferences, uh, history, stuff like that, that's, you know, if, if you're over 100 keys, you're probably doing it wrong. Now, certainly that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, but do kind of keep in mind that this is going to be file I.O. I just wanted to correct myself, it, it was still there. It was still there, well. Yeah, I had to read, like, go to another tab in, in the web inspector and come back and show. That's good, I, I, I'll tell you, I, I can still see IE not keeping that, right. being you know, a lot slower in their updates. Apparently, uh, it's, it's a few different rules in Mozilla, it's, um, based upon when your cookies expire by default. What and, cookies? Um, so let's say your browser says keep your keep all cookies for 120 days. Oh, okay. It's inherited from that. And then, um, let's see here. Yeah, Chrome uh, keeps it as long as your cache isn't cleared. It's, it's uh, persistent as cache. Hmm. And then in uh, IE, um, it says uh, until you basically clear it from your cookies uh, options. Hmm. So I'm assuming it probably is the cookies thing. Mm -hmm. So I would say never assume it's there, yeah. but it's mostly persistent. Certainly persistent enough for things like preferences, I would say, you know, save for stuff like that. So if you change preferences on your cookies or your cache, then really it could be gone against you close your browser or something. It's the wonderful world of HTML5 right there. <laughs> uh, one more quick example I want to show you. And actually, I'll show you two things real quick. So I mentioned how earlier in a Chrome, you can see like cookies. There's also a local storage viewer. So I can see all my values and go in here and actually erase stuff. So what I built here was a very simple search form where I can search for stuff and see results. And I'm using local storage to remember my last searches. So what's nice is that when I come back here, I come back you know, tomorrow, I actually have those last searches there that I can quickly click to get those back. And this was literally you know, five, 10 minutes of code, right? And I think this is a pretty snazzy feature, especially if you're searching for something a lot, having it there instantly. And again, so if this worked for 80% of my people, I'd have no problem spending the hour to add this in because I think it's a great value add. So this FYI, I mentioned the DevTools. So by the way, so I, I, I really like local storage. So I actually built a Chrome extension that tells you when a site is using it because I was curious to see who was using this feature. And this is it right here, and it's telling me that localhost, in this case, there's three things being stored. So I can go in here, I can actually click and see what's being stored. Now, this is my site, so I know most of this, but 
I was playing with parts.com and I had no idea, but they actually added stuff to my local storage. So you go to like CNN, excuse me, and I can see they have one item. Okay, so, so what would that be? That would be, oh, obviously, CBCP. So not always very helpful, but it's kind of cool to see what sites are doing and, and how they're uh, remembering it. Um, I'm a big user of the Amazon MP3 Cloud. Actually, we'll go there. And they store like a crap load of stuff, if I remember right. Because I see four now. Where, uh, where are you seeing four? Right there. Oh, is that, okay. Yeah. Oh, but it's, it's huge. Look at that. See, that's just. You can see the music I was playing. Just all kind of cool stuff. So they are storing a significant. Oh, oh my goodness. They're storing a buttload of data. <laughs> so, yeah, this extension is available at the Chrome Web Store. Uh, I give you the ID, but it's super ugly. It's like 5,000 characters long. Uh, but if you search for a local storage monitor, you'll find it. Now, one interesting thing, this is, this is wacky. So, there is an event that's related to local storage, and it's a storage event, and it gets fired when local storage changes. But here's the fun thing. So this, here's my event handler, and it's just called storage. And when it's run, I get an event, I get, I get told uh, the old value, new value. I get told basically, you know, what got stored essentially. This, this is kind of handy, but it's only fired when somebody else on your computer in the same browser changes it. So the only way this fires is if I go into test forward.html, open up console, there it is. I have to actually open another tab and hit click me. And over here, the event fires. So people have asked a lot of times, hey, how do I know when a user opens up two tabs and does crap? This is one way that you could detect them doing stuff in another tab and possibly do something. Like over here, say, hey, are you using another tab? I may have a data sync issue or whatever. Uh, so this is the only way that you can use it. And that's the event. And actually, yeah, there's an old value and new value. So that's kind of cool. Does it work that way on all browsers or do I can't believe you asked that about HTML5 feature. I mean, come on. <laughs> Dude, uh, we'll try it in Firefox. We'll see what happens. I, I don't have faith in this actually working. So there's, there's my console. Let me repeat this. Re repeat this. I'll go in. We'll do click me. And oh, it ran. Of course it ran. I'd show you IE, but this is a Mac. So oh, we'll do Safari. How about that? Although I have no idea where. Who was using? Who? Uh, I have no idea where the console is. Does anybody here know? Um, I think you do command. Command alt J. I. Window. View. It has to be. This is why I don't use Safari. Uh, I'll go to preferences. Because most Mac users don't know about tools. Yeah. All right. Uh, hey, I'm a Mac user. I'm allowed to say that. Under advanced, probably. Show developer menu. And menu ah, thank you. Sweet. All right. So show. There's a regular console, right? Yeah. Web. So let's say console.log Safari. Okay. So copy. New tab, surprise it has tabs. Click. Oh, there we go. See, I bad mouthed it, so of course it ran. Any questions on this? Because we are leaving the land of things working well into the land of things working not so well. So, good news about storage that's a heck of a lot of green. This is uh, canIuse.com if you've never used it. Uh, it has like 2,000 different web features. So like uh, HTML5 form elements, CSS3 transforms. 
and it gives you very nice charts showing you what the support matrix is. So I'm definitely making use of it in this, in this presentation to show you guys where the support is. 85%, you will not get better than that, pretty much. Even IE8 has it, so that's, that's saying a lot right there. So if you store, as long as the top level key is the same, all that will be in one file? I'm not sure if it's one file or multiple files. It's definitely hidden away by the browser. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be doing multiple files to keep the file uh, the, to keep the file I/O a bit nicer. It's like a file like you know local uh, localhost.txt, for example. Um, I would assume it's one file per host. Okay. I've I've not confirmed that. So. Okay. So let's talk about Web SQL. Raise your hand if you know SQL or if you've used SQL. Great, so the really good thing about this particular feature is that's gonna be reusing skills that web developers have been doing for a long, long time, especially if you've done a lot of server-side stuff. Essentially what this is, is a mini database in your browser. Now this is not SQL Server or Lord forbid Oracle, uh, so there's not you know trillions of records and super deep transactions. It's, it's, you know, it's think above access, below Oracle, essentially, all right? Or if you know anything at all about SQLite, if you've done any Adobe Air development, you know, it supports uh, SQLite as well. Uh, but for most of SQL that I write, for example, it's gonna run it just fine. Uh, it is an asynchronous API, so if you're used to Cold Fusion or PHP, Perl, whatever, you know that normally we say select star from foo and we get the result right there. So this is gonna be very asynchronous. So I will execute my SQL and I have to have a callback handler to accept that response. So if you've never used callbacks before, if you're a JavaScript newbie, uh, bad news, it sucks ass for the first year or so. <laughs> uh, but if you've already gotten over that hump, then you know that it's, it's a pain that you can mainly live with. Uh, so just kind of keep it in mind. So possible uses, uh, storing a lot of content. So the local storage stuff was very, very simple, but I can't do things like search. Technically, I could. I could get every single value out of local storage and do a JavaScript regex on it. That would work, but it would be kind of slow. Web SQL actually allows me to say, I have this, you know, loads and loads of data, and I need to, you know, select star from a note database where the content contains the word football and a date uh, the date created was less than so date, and the category was <coughs> American football. So basically, you know, the, the same types of arbitrary SQL that we can do in a real DB system, we can actually do with Web SQL as well. In terms of how big, it's five megs, and that's again pretty consistent. <coughs> if you go over that five megs, the user is supposed to be prompted for more. So they'll get some type of UI that says, hey, this is trying to store data uh, over five minutes. Do you want to grant them more access? And they will hopefully say yes, and you can uh, continue on your merry way. If they say no, you're screwed, essentially. So here is, let me select this again. <coughs> Excuse me. The basic idea here is that on the window object, there's an API that will open the DB. We have a name, and that's used to kind of bucket that uh, DB, and you can have multiples of these if you want. You have a version number. You have a nice name, which is not used anywhere, so it's kind of pointless. And then you have a requested size. Once you have this hook, and this is actually synchronous, you can then begin doing transactions on it, where you can execute various SQL statements. In this case, I have a read transaction. I know this is a bit nested, uh, but essentially, I open a transaction, I get that transaction object, I execute SQL, and in my final result, I get a nice little array of values back that I can iterate over and do whatever I want to with. And I'm right in front of you, sorry about that. So I know it's kind of callback hell there a little bit, but does that kind of make sense? 
A little bit? A little bit, yeah. Definitely, so yeah, what I would recommend is abstracting this a bit. So if I was building a note database, and I actually have an example of that, um, you can abstract part of this away into a nice controller file, for example, where all this is hidden. So your front end code can just say, hey, give me the notes. The back end, hand, well, not the back end, the other JavaScript files kind of handling the messy SQL part and just giving you the values back. So there are things that you can do to make this a bit simpler to use. Um, I actually have a utility library somewhere on my blog that abstracts away a lot of the uh, callback hell and makes it a bit simpler to use. So as an example, so this begins a bit like the first one. I open my database, okay? I need to initialize what's in there. Now luckily the SQL for this is not too difficult, but I did kind of, instead of making the callbacks, I broke them into separate functions. This is purely a judgment call. You could have all your code, like my first slide, where it's kind of nested, 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 or you can break it out. Now I'll, I'll go back and forth, but especially for this, it felt better having the initialization be kind of nicely segregated out here. There is a very simple SQL statement that will handle creating, if it doesn't exist, create table if not exist. So that one line there basically handles, on the first run, make the table. Every call after that will be fine. Uh, if you ever did anything with Adobe Air and SQLite, they actually had an API that, you could, that would allow you to introspect the tables, and you could use that instead. Uh, we don't have that here at all. So you essentially have to always run this but this is probably five milliseconds or so. So it's not really a, a painful thing to start up. But basically, and here's the other fun part, uh, pretty much every other API in the world when it uses callbacks, it's almost always do something and then on success do this, on error do that. WebSQL on error is the first one, on success is the second one. That's what it is. I have a very generic handler. I'm uh, just doing console.logs. Normally you'd want to use real UI and tell the user that you can do whatever. But when things are ready, what I did with this demo was a very simple kind of log. So instead of just like recording the number of hits like I did with local storage, I'm actually storing the page you hit. You can imagine this being in a global JavaScript file for your server window that location href is dynamic, so it would pick index.html versus about.html, whatever. I could add the query string as well if I wanted. But I store the page and the time into my page view history. So I can actually track, or you can track because this is running on your browser, but we can keep a track of every page you've hit and the time you did it. Below this, I had just have an automatic, simple select star, and I get that stuff out, and I start drawing out HTML. So this is kind of a brain dead, stupid, just log the view and show all views. And if we actually go into here, we can see I was doing some testing this morning. And as I reload, and if you're curious about what stuff looks like, you'll notice that my result set is a simple array, so I can do dot length on it. But the actual row comes from a dot item API. You ask me why. So basically, I have this array, and then to actually get the row, I call dot item. Once I have that, that's a simple hash map. So uh, row dot page, row dot whatever. So I've written another utility function that basically allows me to pass the result set and just get a plain simple um, array of structs back. That kind of makes sense? As an example of what an error looks like, I put some intentionally some bad SQL into here. Now normally this would never happen in production, so I'm not too concerned about handling bad SQL, but in theory it could happen. 
all I did was record the error and you could see it in the console right here. So I get a SQL error type error with a message with that prepare statement and it shows me what it was trying to do. So you do have nice error handling. Kind of making sense? As a more advanced example, I, I am just a huge fan of Evernote and note taking apps in general. So I built a very simple note application where all the data is stored on the browser where I can go in and click add note. And I'm using this great UI framework called Bootstrap. Have you all heard about Bootstrap? Maybe? Okay, yeah. Uh, every web app now uses it. So everyone loves Bootstrap. So now I have this note stored on my browser. If I were to reload, it would be there. I could edit, I could add more notes. But basically, I have a full application now running in the client. If I was offline, this would work just fine, period. Again, because all my data is stored locally. Uh, it's not syncing up to the server. I can do that. You can build uh, synchronization into this. You can ping the server and say, hey, here's my data uploaded, or the server can send you data that you can put into WebSQL. If you want to get that complex, you certainly can. So you obviously would risk losing this, so if you ever <coughs> cleared any type of, I guess, cache, would it be cache? Would you clear that as well? As far as I know, there's no way for the user to clear this, not directly. I don't believe the cache will clear. I've not tested it. So uh, now there is a way in Chrome DevTools. We'll see in a second. Um, it, it should be safe. I think he's looking up right now to see about. Actually, we can, let's clear the cache and see what happens. And I always forget. Where that is, advanced settings. I'm not sure why cache is advanced settings. Yeah, clear, browse, clear browsing data, you just scroll by it. I did, uh, say, clear browsing say button. when? Keep going up, keep going up right there. All right, let's see, so it is not, uh, could. Yeah, maybe that last one. We'll try that, and cache, obviously, and history. And we'll see what happens. That was very fast. I don't believe it actually worked. So we'll see. Cool. So uh, yeah, I, I think the user can't clear it. That's pretty interesting. Now, I, this was actually coming up in the next slide, but once again, in Chrome DevTools, you go into here and see the databases and what's cool is that you can actually look at the table and even uh, work for me, write SQL. So while testing, this is really, really handy. So like star from notes where ID equals two. By the way, it does support uh, parameters. So you can do bound parameters as well. And this should work. What? Delete star from notes. What? Delete from notes. That's interesting. Oh wait, delete from notes. It's actually rewriting it. Oh, it's actually just executing it. So there you go. So that would be all. That would be a personal use, though. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so again, I mean, you, you can build sync right. features into it. It becomes non-trivial to handle conflicts and stuff like that. Um, if you're doing something where you're looking to provide data to the user in a read-only format, like, for example, an intranet, you can easily push down your entire employee uh, list, right, like a 1,000 employees. 
and provide them the ability to search list contacts. And so that would be an issue where the client's database is a copy. So when the server is updated, you just nuke their client side. Uh, that would be not as bad, not trivial. Um, but still give you the, the, the faster searches, the offline ability, and stuff like that. Make sense? Yeah, well, yeah, no, if you were doing a bunch of, maybe a user doing a bunch of data entry, you could track that and at the end of their, if they want to say, what have you done? No. They could see, here's, you've entered X for this and Y for that. Yeah, the ability to, to track user stuff in general is, is, is really, really powerful nowadays. And in a good way. Yeah, they don't even need to know if, and then yep. you could, if they called you with the errors, you'd say, oh, we have an ability to go, I can go look. Yeah. Yeah, so that uh, that that whole page view thing right there was totally hidden from them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was showing it, but I, I could have hidden that uh, as well. And for for an internet, that could be pretty handy. I would hope that most sites aren't doing stuff like that. But so I mentioned uh, Chrome DevTools. Again, you can do arbitrary SQL, which is really cool. So here comes the beginning of the bad news. So you have Chrome and no Firefox and partial NIE. On the mobile side, it's very, very good. So all of iOS, uh, all of Android, even Chrome supports it great. So this is a really good solution for mobile. For desktop, not so much. And I'm going to talk a bit more about why uh, once I give you more bad news. Okay, so. All right, so imagine you're the internet gods. And it's very, you know, you know the episode of, of The Simpsons, like, where, like all the bad guys are in the uh, big mansion and they're all smoking cigars and drinking cognac and talking about they're going to screw the world and all that. Uh, that's how I imagine the. Uh, the, the, the web people sometimes. Uh, even though I love the web, <laughs> I'm on tape. Uh, so they have this spec for Web SQL, which it uses SQL that, again, a lot of us web people have already been using for a long time and are really comfortable with. We have that in bucket A. And then we have bucket B, which is this really, really weird solution called index, uh, index DB. Now, index DB is powerful. Uh, but it's slightly more complex. More complex as in SimCity versus actually running New York City. So if you can imagine that level on a, on a bar chart somewhere, uh, you can obviously use it. Um, if you follow my blog, you know I've been blogging about it, and every blog post is typically, this wasn't working for a day, this is how I fixed it. Uh, and normally the, the solution is kind of obvious once I uh, find it, but it's just not as friendly as, as, as WebSQL. So like WebSQL, it is a system that will allow you to store a lot of data. Uh, I have pushed about like 15,000, not rows, we'll talk about what it is, but uh, objects of data and it was just fine. It, it had no issue with that at all. One thing that makes it a bit cooler than uh, WebSQL Anybody here use MongoDB? All right, uh, NoSQL. Have you heard of NoSQL type solutions? So one of the very, very cool things about NoSQL is that this whole idea of a, of a table kind of goes away. And if you want to put fairies and unicorns in, a, in, in your data, it's fine. Whatever you want to with that. Now, as a SQL guy, that was very scary. Until I was working with a service called Open Amplify, and they do textual analysis of, of text. So they'll take a paragraph, and they will tell you like 500 different things about that text. It's aggressive. It's probably a male. It's probably a young male. It talks about Cheerios and beer. I mean, this, this reams of data about this text. Now, this comes back to you in this ginormous packet of JSON data. I wanted to do some very deep analysis of a lot of text. So I began thinking about, oh my god, how am I going, uh, how am I going to convert this JSON packet which has hash maps and arrays? In SQL, that would be 
core table, we have link tables, with uh, would be like a lot of tables. I used Mongo, and I just stored it. Done. Five minutes. And just plain worked. So you do get the benefit of being able to say, I have this very free form data, and I just want to store it. And that's really, really <coughs> handy. Uh, it is an indexed base API, and I'll explain that in a second. And like WebSQL, it's also asynchronous. So in terms of size, really, really big, 50 megs. Again, the user can be prompted for more. So in terms of where this gets a bit weird, with SQL, we're used to you know, select star, right? Or give me all the rows where certain conditions. With an index DB system, everything is based on a particular index. So think of like a primary key, all right? Select so star from table where ID equals five. That's not too crazy. So that is the primary way that we will get data from an index DB system. On top of that, you can also add additional indexes. So when you look at your data, you start thinking about how do I, or in what ways, would I want to retrieve this information? Imagine a person or a person object. A person has an ID, they have a name, they have a gender, uh, they have an age, they have a handiness, they have a bio, a resume, blah, blah, blah. So I have a bunch of those properties, but in terms of my application that I'm building, I may think to myself, I will only care about grouping people by gender. So I would say I need to build an index on that particular property. I will define, I'll say, hey, I want an index on gender. So once I have that, I can get records based on that index. Give me all the people who are male. You can also create what's called a range. So if I am doing a index on names, for example, I can say, give me all the names that begin with A and give me up to C. Okay? Have I not lost anyone yet? I had a real, really hard time with this. So if it's, if it's just me, just tell me, because that, that's fine. Um, what you can't do is mix them up. So going back to my person metaphor, I cannot say, give me all the men whose name begins with A who are 20 to 25 years old. That's nothing in SQL. That's you know, one where condition, but very, very easy. At IndexDB, you cannot do stuff like that. So you have to be very forethinking, forethoughtful. I'm making up words here. You have to be really cognizant of how you will be getting your data and recognize that you cannot perform these kind of wild and crazy ad hoc searches that you can in WebSQL. Now, that's not, that's not a NoSQL bug at all. If you use MongoDB, if you use a real NoSQL solution, you can do crazy crap. You can do you know, as, as deeply nested as you want, and it works just fine. Uh, from what I've heard from the browser makers, so one of them in particular uh, at Opera, the whole idea of search is just being put off to like next year. So we're kind of like on the edge now of the browsers and what's actually being supported out there. So think of it as plus side, a bit more free form in terms of how I'm storing data. You'll see the storage is really, really simple. Con side, searching is kind of like nothing. Or at least any type of complex searching is not there at all. Have I lost anybody yet? Because it gets weirder. Okay. In the web SQL world, it was kind of mostly easy to create tables. I could say, you know, if it doesn't exist, just make it. So that runs just fine. In index DB, you can only make changes to the underlying structure by changing the version. So when I deploy my app, I will say I am making version one. And because and when you come in as your first hit, that will be a version change because you don't have any database for me. It'll be changing the version one. And I could write code in there to say, hey, okay, make this object store. And I'll give an, uh, a definition of that in a second. But think of it like a table. So I can only do it at that point. If I decide later on, you know, if I just have a people store at first and I want to add a books store or something else, 
I have to actually change the version in the code and ensure that my code handles only adding the books if you don't have it and doing both of them if you do have it. Does that, does that seem tricky? Painful, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, get it right the first time <laughs> as much as possible. And even better, Chrome uh, shits a brick on all this right now. Um, Chrome supports an older API called set version that you would run. <laughs> so you can support Chrome and Firefox in this, but the code gets a bit gnarly. Chrome is not to spec. Here's where it gets fun. Uh, Chrome Canary on OS X is the spec. Chrome Canary on Windows 7 is not. So when I was double checking my demos last week, it worked great on the Mac. I was like, cool. And I went to my Windows machine, exact same Canary version, and it didn't work. So I, I'm going to mainly focus on showing you this in Firefox and showing you that code because that's where it works correctly. Uh, and Chrome is supposedly inching towards doing things the right way. And if you absolutely do need to support Chrome now, you can't. It's not that much more code. A few basic terms. Key, like primary key, every object store will have it. Object store, just like tables. Indexes are, again, in database stuff, an, an index is a way to tell the database, hey, note this crap because I'll be doing searching and sorting and stuff on it. So do what you got to do to make it faster. For index DB and indexes, I'll be doing fetches on this. I'll be asking for name equals ray or you know, et cetera. So store that a bit differently. When we want to actually loop over data, we'll have a cursor. You'll see some examples of that. And the key range is the other way of getting the data out. So I mentioned you can get a, you can get a particular key or a range of keys. All right, so some examples. And this gets a little bit crazy. Let me just uh, let me start closing stuff because we got to focus on this. This is where you want to get a beer. All right, so very first example. Now, this example, if you guys run it at home or here, uh, this does nothing at all. Uh, I, I wanted to demonstrate the setup code just by itself because it was so weird. I didn't want anything else confusing it. So I have some basic prefixing going on here. Even though I'm, I'm just doing Firefox here, I don't really need it, but just to make the code a bit simpler, okay? I begin by opening it. So far, so good, right? It's line 25, okay? This is not synchronous like WebSQL, so I have an asynchronous function listening to on upgrade needed. First time you hit the site, it doesn't really feel like an upgrade, but it is an upgrade for you because it's your first time there. This is where I would begin to make changes to my object stores and get think tables. Now, technically, I don't need to check to see if it exists, but I'm doing that by looking at a object store's names property and seeing if it's not there, then I create it. The values that are off screen there, just say that I want an ID property and I want it to be auto increment. So I don't have to set my ID values. This is a nice thing, actually. I'll just store data and IndexDB will take care of making an ID property and making an auto increment. Let me actually go back. The next handler on success, this is called when it's really done. So the first time you hit this in Firefox anyway, it's going to run on upgrade needed. It'll do the setup. It will then run on success. The second time you come in, it will recognize that it's already done version one and not do that again and just do on success. So if you realize that you forgot an object store, that's where you have to go in and change the code to version two and start adding a logic to say, like I did up here, if I don't have tests, make it. If I don't have whatever the second store is, make that as well. Okay, so far? 
And again, so this, this demo actually does nothing at all with it, just kind of loads up. So this one, now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna skip some of the code that I've already done. This is the same upgrade needed, the same on success. I'm now adding the ability to store and list data, okay? So I have a click handler that will just add some data. It's just gonna add some static data quickly for me. Uh, it's not even a real form. And I have a display data that's gonna get stuff. Let's look at adding because it's a bit simpler. I'm gonna skip over this. I create a transaction. And this is kind of funny. So you create a transaction and you tell it this is the object store that I'll be working with. So that kind of makes sense. That can make it more performant so it knows where it's going. But then after I do that, I still have to get the object store. So I'm telling you I'm working with your pencil. Now I would like your pencil. Um, storing data, again, totally freeform. So I, as much as I like WebSQL, I, this turns me on. This is a JavaScript object. I can just make it, store it, pass in via object store dot add, and I tell it when you're done, I rerun my display function. So I think storing data, this is really, really nice. Displaying, I do a transaction. This is read only. This one was read write when I was adding data, but now it's just read only. I create a cursor. When that request has a success, it's given a cursor object. The cursor is the actual data. It's one row from a table if we're thinking about WebSQL. Within there, I have two things. Cursor.key is the primary key, and cursor.value is the data store. So dot value is the actual object. And you can see in here, I wrote generic code to say just get all the keys. Oh, no get all the things inside of cursor.value. I don't want to say key again because that's also the ID value. But basically, I probably wouldn't have that production. I would know I stored, what did I say, like name and date, whatever. I would know what I, I was storing and write code specifically to that. Does that kind of make sense? All right, so if we look at this in Firefox, because Chrome will poop on it, There's a prompt, so that should be a one-time thing, and there's my data. And see, the ID was automatic, and if I reload this, it's all still there. Notice that I was able to pass a date as is. I didn't have to muck with that, I just made a new date. If I wanted to get crazy, this may not render well, but we'll see what happens. We'll add, we'll add the, the array in. And it worked. So this is the only part that I like compared to WebSQL. So you only manage each row can have a different animal? I wouldn't say it's the only advantage. Uh, being able to be, being able to store objects as opposed to, you know, I have to have these, these multiple tables and the relationships. That is a, a, a good thing, it's a powerful thing. Uh, the setup, all that crap on top is kind of the painful part. And there's more pain coming. So this is just the beginning of, of the pain. So it gets, it, it gets better. So now, if, if you're wondering why, why in the heck would I use this over a WebSQL? Yeah, that, that answer is coming. So another example, just to show you what delete looks like. Let me actually run this so you guys can see it in action. So same concept, add stuff, and I added basic delete functionality. Notice that it does not reuse ID equals one. It recognizes that it was there before, but now it's gone. So deleting is pretty darn simple.
And this one, instead of having multiple lines of code, I just put it all chained together. You don't have to write it this way. DB.transaction returns an object that I could work on, but instead of, of, of working with multiple variables, I just chained it all. So dot object store, dot delete, basically all in one line. Open the transaction, get my object store, delete this key. Does that, does that make sense? The, uh, so the, the uh, index DB is chainable? Is that yes. what's, okay. Yeah, so if you compare, so like this could have been there trans equals DB dot transaction. I'm typoing, but just imagine it. Uh, there OS equals TR that object store. And then verrec, verrec equals object time delete. So this, this would be the exact same code. And actually this uh, display shows it a bit broken up. But really, so that, that comes out to a style, like what, what makes you feel better. Definitely when I first started doing this, I was not writing it like this at all because uh, it was too scary. So as a quick example of Chrome support, if you wanted to ship this right now, again, on upgrade needed is totally ignored by Chrome, but on success is not. So I do a check here. If my object store is not there, I run set version, which only works for Chrome. And in there, I have an on success where I can create an object store. So I'm actually repeating the same line here for Firefox and here for Chrome. If I wanted to, I could abstract that out into one line, make it a bit simpler. But again, in theory, this is meant to go away uh, someday soon for Chrome, but this should work. Oops, indexed, indexed DB. It should work now. And because I said it would work, it's not gonna work. So we'll just lie and go to Canary. I know it's gonna work. And actually, the original example should work just fine. There we go. And also, Chrome does have an IndexedDB viewer in the tools. It's very, uh, you can't do ad hoc queries, for example, but it is there. And even for complex objects, it works kind of nice. So it's something. So in terms of uh, uh, practical examples of this, uh, I built a demo for a website where I use Ajax to download like a thousand names. Uh, and I store those names in IndexedDB. And I built a autocomplete dropdown so as, as you begin typing a person's name, it hits index CB to find a list of employees, finds the matches based on you know starting, uh, and shows you all their names in a dropdown. And it's instant because it's on the client's machine. So there's no multiple Ajax loads after the first time. Uh, and you have you know, basically the entire employee database at your fingertips. You would want to <coughs> probably download that. <clears throat> Each time they would log in, maybe or not, depending on how active your employee. Service. Yeah, yeah, and you could do things like build an AJAX service that would tell you the last modification date and compare it to a local storage. You can mix up a bit yeah. and see if it needs syncing. So, mention that. So here's the fun part. Where is it supported? Notice that it's supported in Firefox and Chrome. Yes, remember Chrome has the startup things. But notice the great void over here in mobile land, as I call it. For the five people who have Chrome for Android, well, I guess you could do that for ICS now, right? Is it, yeah. supported, is, it, is it supported below ICS? So it's just ICS and above, right? So, I think so. So for 10 people, uh, I have ICS, so I have it. Uh, you're kosher, uh, but iOS, even iOS 6, is uh, as a maybe. Um, and actually, under NDA, I have access to that. I checked; it's not listed yet. So I, I broke NDA, but I don't care. 
Uh, so this is probably a no still. So you see this, right? <laughs> you see this. The reason we're in this scenario, this is my take on it. And if you go to the spec for WebSQL, because browser makers only wanted to use one implementation, SQLite, they decided that wasn't good enough to build a real spec out of it because it was only one implementation. I don't honestly rock that. That's a bit like saying that, oh, we had to have peace because we wanted to stop fighting and all agree on something. Uh, but the, web, the, the, the actual WebSQL spec says this is no longer supported. So WebSQL's dead. Yeah, it's just it's dead. So it's, it's not going forward. So Firefox doesn't support it at all, and will never support it. Uh, also, I think it's because SQL doesn't have a spec, which seems like a bullshit thing to me. There's like a SQL 92 spec, I believe, for the, the, the language. But it, it, I'm definitely not anti-spec at all. But this really feels like a case of the practical people losing out to uh, people who are too formal about specs. So IndexedDB is supposed to be what you use in the future. But just bear in mind that you'll have absolutely no global support at all. So my thinking uh, is WebSQL. Keep in mind that it may stop working. Uh, but mobile browsers don't change very often. They're, they're a lot slower than desktop. So you, you don't have to worry about that going away tomorrow for sure. It's not going away in Chrome as far as I know. And with Firefox at like 30%, I, I have no problem saying Firefox users, they can't use my site. Now obviously that's a case by case basis. Uh, there are libraries out there that try to work with IndexedDB and WebSQL, you know, basically whatever is supported. Uh, there's one called LaunchAir. I haven't used it, so I can't tell you if it's you know worthwhile to use out there. Um, again, my my thinking right now is that when I build mobile apps, I'll use WebSQL, especially with PhoneGap. It's built in there, so if there's no support for it, it shims it in essentially. Uh, I use IndexedDB going forward for my desktop apps, even though it's not supported in a great manner. Then again, I'm an evangelist. I don't do real work. Right? I build a lot of proof of concepts, so I can say stuff like that. Uh, but just kind of keep these charts in mind. As much as I talk about like, like how bad IndexedDB is, after struggling with it for a couple of days, I did get more comfortable with it. I did build you know, real demos with it. Uh, I, if in five years it's supported on mobile, supported on desktop, it will be a decent enough solution. Uh, so it's not like all hell. And sad cat is sad. Okay. Our last feature. I'm okay on top. I can keep talking. Okay. So file system. This is uh, even less supported than IndexedDB, I think, right now. Uh, but it's very, very interesting. So this is not the file API. There's kind of two APIs that you may have heard about. The file API is an API that allows you to read and work with files. The typical examples that you will see on various blogs is here's a input type equals file. I select a file, then I draw the picture that you just picked. Or I, I resize it or I uh, uh, do a filter on it, whatever. The file API when you, when the end user picks a file or does a drag drop into the browser, the file API lets them actually work with those file objects. The file system API is a bit different. It's essentially a sandbox file system for the browser. So it makes use of the file API to work with files, but it's a separate API to handle that particular file system. There is a temporary and a persistent system. Outside that, excuse me, the API is pretty much the same. So for example, when you list a directory, it's the exact same API, whether it's temporary or uh, persistent. There's a basic quota API, which is required for persistent storage. Where basically you tell the user, may I please have five megs? And the user says, yes. 
Here's the fun thing about the quoted API. I was testing with it and I began adding zeros to see what would happen. And I got to like 500 terabytes and it kept saying yes. So quote API, kind of a work in progress right now. Uh, it will give you like five petabytes if you say it. What happens if you actually do that? Uh, I have an old laptop. I may try one day just to see what happens to see if Chrome can actually kill the system. I may do that tonight actually. Uh, I mean, bring it back home. So there is that API that's on top of it. It's also all asynchronous, which makes it a bit difficult. Again, call back help, but we can get around that. Uh, in terms of uses, great example, I think. Um, I built a demo one time for an HTML5 game. It wasn't actually a game. I built the stuff around it, but where I wanted to store resources, so sounds and pictures for the game. Because we have a file system, my front end actually did an Ajax call, said give me a zip file. It downloaded the zip file. It used a JavaScript library for parsing zip files. I extracted the zip and I stored everything in the file system. Again, this was all segregated away. This wasn't like C colon slash. No, this is some wonky hidden system, whatever. But to my code, it was slash. So I can make a folder called game resources, game resources slash sounds, and put all that in there. And now going forward, when the user starts playing my game, those sounds can run from the local file system, uh, from the local sandbox file system. But they're there, there's no network calls, they just run. Does that kind of make sense? By the way, there's no way to erase those files right now. There's no, no way at all. Uh, well, there, there's an API to erase files, so if you actually write the code, you can erase those files, but users cannot clear that at all. And why would they want to clear that? Come on. Um, so, in terms of how big, I talked about it, the quoted API. You have to use it for persistent usage, but don't trust it. You know, don't, don't ask for five terabytes because you'll be given it. Uh, the user is prompted. Once the user says yes, they can't say no again. That's great. Uh, and they will only get prompted again if you ask for more storage. And again, I, possibly, I would imagine browsers will be a bit more uh, careful about that in the future and actually give users a way to revoke access. So in terms of what you can do, pretty much everything that you can do with like Cold Fusion, PHP, whatever. So directory CRUD, file CRUD, listing stuff out. Getting file on metadata, so if you only care about the size or last modification date, I mean, it, 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 it is, for all intents and purposes, a file system in the browser. Some of the objects that you have access to, that you'll see in examples, file system, directory reader, file reader, etc. cetera. This is really part of file reader, but that's part of the file API. And again, this is a bit intermingled here, obviously, but uh, the file system API, for example, when I do a directory reader, will give me entries back that pertain to the file API. Does that make sense? All right, so as a quick example, so I'm going to skip over a little bit of this. So right now, this is Chrome only, okay? And all I'm doing is just asking for a file system. So you can see the quota API where I'm telling it what type. Now, according to spec, if you're doing a temporary file system, you don't have to ask for quota, but you do have to for persistent. I asked for, as I had 20 megs or 20 gigs, I don't remember, but it's a lot. And then I'm actually told in the success handler how much I was given. So apparently, there's support for uh, bringing down the amount of bytes. So even though the, the user is not asked, well, if, if no, how much? It's just yes or no. Apparently, you could be given less than what you asked for. Now, you would think, like, where I asked for two terabytes and the user said yes, you would imagine Chrome would say, well, okay, seriously, this is a one terabyte box. Uh, I can only use half of that, whatever. I'll give you, I mean, that'd be great, right? It would, you know, give you a, a sensible number. No, it won't do that. 
So as far as I know, this grant of bytes always equals what you asked for. And then once I've been given it, I can then ask for the file system. Again, right now it's vendor prefixed. And then once I have it, I essentially have an object that equals slash. So as a quick, uh, I'm not actually doing much with this, but if we look at this, there's the prompt. Say sure, why not? And there we go. So the name is this very funky thing. I have a root property, which is my directory, and the full path right there is slash. Even on Windows, it's slash. As another example, let me just scroll down to see what I'm actually doing here. Okay, let me run this. I actually borrowed this demo. So this is a very simple text editor. Right, go in and hit save. And this is actually storing now to the file system. If I come back here and reload this, it's reading it back in. And all it's doing is having a save handler and a essentially unload handler. And you can see, let's focus on this one. The read content, again, again this is all asynchronous. I can ask it to get the file, get a file entry, create a reader, and create various listeners. So this is, again, this is definitely callback hell, but not too many lines. There's support for doing binary reading. There's support for doing slices. So if I wanted a terabyte file and wanted to actually show you like a thousand lines of each uh, from that, I could actually build a file reader that would go over that and show you one slice at a time. So very, very bleeding edge now. Uh, somebody actually built a terminal with the file system. I can do ls, make their foo, cd foo, uh, touch hello.txt. Oh, all right, help. <laughs> so let's actually drop a photo in here, not a movie. There it is. Yeah. Wow. So that's a mixture of the file API, drag and drop API, file system API. There is a Chrome extension. I like our touch green. What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Called Peephole. There it is. I wasn't sure about the icon. That gives you a view, kind of like my local storage monitor. This is not for me. But I can actually see the file system. Come on and actually view stuff. And I'm not sure who makes this, but if you search for, oops, if you search for people, you'll find it again. I, I run it so I can see if anyone's using it. No one's using it. Outside of demos, pretty much. Uh, as far as I know, no one's doing it. That's mainly because support right now, <laughs> just Chrome. Oh, and Blackberry, that's, that's awesome. Really true. What's that? In the near future. So for the two of you with the BlackBerry, I'm sorry first, uh, but you have support for it as well. But again, so, yeah, like, like, so going back to my example of the game, right? So if you don't support this, then you don't support it. If you do support it, then I mean, think about it, you get all those, all those sounds, all those kind of large binary files instantaneously. So you get a much better performance for Chrome, which actually is 27%, that's actually not a small minority. That's, you know, if I could add that feature of, you know, downloading local media in like three hours, that's probably worthwhile for a quarter of my customers right there. Especially again, if they tell their friends that your game is the hotness. All right, so thank you for listening for so long. Uh, some links, uh, especially some ones that were very, very useful to me for building these examples. HTML5rocks.com is probably the best one. Uh, dive into HTML5. The site was abandoned uh, about a, a year or so ago, and other people have kind of taken it up. 
Um, I have found that these other authors, I, I'm happy that they've taken that mantle up. They don't have the same voice as the original author, and you can really kind of tell that it's multiple people. So it's not quite as up to date as I would like, but it's a very good introductory type thing. Uh, but I think they have nothing about like file system at all. Uh, Mozilla.org, sorry, developer.mozilla.org. Um, if you've ever Googled for something and end up on uh, W3 Schools and not want it to be there, what I recommend, and please have nothing embarrassing in my history. So instead of doing like array splice JavaScript and ending up at W3 Schools, type MDN in front and you always end up on Mozilla's site. And actually the Chrome team, this is where they're doing their documentation now as well. So you know, I, I'm primarily a Chrome person. I still will do MDN for everything now, JS related. And that's it. Thank you all for listening for so long. <laughs>